This is an ABC podcast. Today it's the final of our Best of 2022 programs and today it's my conversation with the wonderful Elizabeth Chong. In my family, when someone's feeling a bit poorly, my wife makes Hainan chicken rice from an old family recipe from Singapore. Poached chicken, sliced tomato, cucumber, shallots. On the side, there's dark soy, crushed garlic and chilli, accompanied by rice that's cooked in a heavenly chicken stock and a little bit of the soup as well. And there is a subtle perfection to this recipe of chicken rice. And when it's done well, you understand how fine it is and why people get so obsessed with it. Over the course of her life, Elizabeth Chong has done more than anyone to introduce Australians to the glory of Chinese cuisine. Elizabeth has spent the last 60-odd years cooking, teaching, preaching about the beauty of Chinese food, and that makes her a great Australian. Elizabeth was actually born in China, but her family has roots in Australia dating back to the 1850s. She grew up near Melbourne's Victoria Markets, And her dad masterminded the rise of the dim sim in Australia. Yes, the deep fried dim sim. Elizabeth has taught more than 30,000 Australians how to cook Chinese food. Her first book, The Heritage of Chinese Cooking, was an instant classic blending food with history and culture. And now at the age of 90, Elizabeth Chong has a story to tell. Hello, Elizabeth. Hello, Richard. Hello. That was a lovely introduction. Thank you very much for it. Oh, of course. Like I say, chicken rice is the comfort food in our family. Can I share a story about chicken rice with you now? Please. I remember being in Singapore on business and staying at the Oriental Hotel. And I was about to order the usual, you know, American breakfast or English breakfast. And I saw a businessman eating on the table over the road with something on a tray. And I looked at that and I said to to my waiter straight away, can I have what he's having instead? And he brought over, and it was my first introduction to chicken rice. (laughs) And I was absolutely bowled over by the beauty of it. And I heard afterwards that's one of the best places then it was that you can have chicken (laughs) rice. And you're right when you say when it's done perfectly, you, 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 you can't find a fault with it. It's just beautiful. And since then... I have been addicted to it, so addicted that I I met a a student who hailed from Singapore and he said, next holiday, would you like to have a holiday in Singapore, (laughs) my mother's house? And she, you know what she did? She went and engaged Fatty Chan, I think was his name, who was the (laughs) greatest exponent of chicken rice to her house. She was so influential. And he gave me a private lesson on how to cook chicken rice. And I still have it, a little a little place here in, in Collingwood. I still go there for my chicken rice. I think the whole issue, Elizabeth, of who makes the best chicken rice is deeply contentious. I went to the to the town of Malacca in Malaysia, which is not, not far, a couple of hours out of Kuala Lumpur, which is where with the old spice trading city of, oh, yes, of, yes, from yes. the spice trading years. And uh, there's like a bunch of chicken rice places and all of them say, we have the okay. best chicken rice <laughs> in the world here. And the other one says, no, we have the best chicken rice in the world here. But it's a glorious thing. The fine of the broth seems to be oh, really important here. You've yes. got to skim all the fat off it, don't you? That's, right. That's the key, isn't it? That really good broth. It's the chicken. It's just silky and mm. the rice is flavoured with the garlic and the ginger and the chicken broth and it is just, it's just the most beautiful and so simple in its outward appearance, but to make it, it just requires that little bit of extra skill. You were three when your family settled in Melbourne or came back to Melbourne. Yes. Can you remember anything at all? Do you have any pictures in your head of what Australians look like? Do you, do we look, did everyone look weird to you back there? Well, evidently, I don't remember this incident, but I was told by my mother that when the ship landed, my father was on the dock and he was accompanied by a next door neighbour opposite the market. She used to have a milk bar and she helped my father get around because his English wasn't good. And she was on the dock with him and she was a very large lady with enormous <laughs> bosoms and snow white hair. And I, as a little two and a half year old from China, I had never seen a human being <laughs> except a Chinese person. And I believe I ran screaming back to my mother and said, I've seen a ghost. I've seen a ghost. <laughs> because the Chinese talk about ghosts a lot, but it was kindly Mrs Hall and she gathered me into that big bosom of hers and I could smell cabbage. 
and I can smell altogether apart from her looks. <laughs> so I, do, I don't remember seeing her, but I do remember that smell. What do you remember of the family home from your earliest years oh. in Franklin Street, Melbourne? Well, the, when we first came, that was 1934, my father uh, had a quite a large wholesale fruit business at the Victoria Market, which was the wholesale place there in West Melbourne then. And opposite there in Franklin Street, there was a sort of a factory at the back, but there was a dwelling upstairs. And he must have I think he must have leased that factory, but we lived in the rooms upstairs, four little tiny rooms above the factory. And my grandmother came out with us, that's my dad's mum, with my mum and my siblings and myself. And so there were one, two, three, five of us in that little four-room place upstairs. And we had a lot of um, extended family gatherings there. We would go downstairs to the factory area where my father also had a little retail shop. And uncles and aunts and cousins and pe people who worked for my dad, they would all be there. And there was always food, lots of food and lots of laughter. And, and I felt very secure there because it was just like they were all family. And where would you play as a little kid around that area? Well, the Victoria Market, uh, especially on a Sunday when uh, everything was closed and there were just piles and piles of orange boxes and pineapple boxes and things and we kids would be climbing and hide and seek and the whole area was my playground. And then next door to where we lived, there was an iron foundry I don't know, I've never seen one since, but I knew that I can remember great big long chains hanging down and my brother and I used to pretend we were Tarzan and Jane. You know, <laughs> swing on those big chains. So, and, and we were just a stone's throw from the Flagstaff Gardens there and that was paradise. We big peppercorn trees, we'd climb those trees and get the caterpillars. Your dad's mother, your paternal grandmother, was living with you in Melbourne. What do you remember of her? Oh, a lot, a lot, because she lived there with us in those four little rooms. She was a tiny, tiny little lady. I can see her now with her grey hair in a bun and her trouser suit, and she used to walk very slowly. And, uh, and I remember that she taught me how to wash rice and she stood on a little stool to wash the rice. And she also taught me how to knit. <laughs> I can remember her teaching me how to knit because they used to knit squares to sew into making blankets for the war effort because the China, China, Japan war was on at that time too, um, when I was still living there. Oh, of course, and that was before we entered the war. The war was already going on between China and Japan, wasn't it? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. This is just China and Japan. And um, my father was very patriotic, the nationalists then, under Chiang Kai-shek. And um, they used to make knit and sew up these little squares to make blankets and and one day I remember not having anything to do and I thought, I'll be busy too, and I got a pair of scissors and I, <laughs> I cut all those blankets back into little squares again. That was your bit to defeat Tojo I in the war. That was my bit for the war effort, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and what was your relationship with your siblings like as a kid? Oh, very close, very close. Um, there were four of us together. Later on, my mother had two more, but, but it was like a second family. <laughs> but the four of us, we were closely bonded. And in particular, I think my eldest sister was always a bit too, well, she was like the responsible one, and but she didn't get into mischief like I did with my brother and my sister, who was only 17 months older than I. But we three, we did everything together. And uh, you, know, you couldn't help it because you lived at such close quarters. And I mean, we, I think we, I used to have the odd squabble with my brother and so forth. But I know on the whole, we did everything together. We went on holidays, camping, walked to school together. How about your mum? What kind of a cook was she, Elizabeth? My mother was, as I, I don't remember those early days because cooking didn't seem to matter to me so long as I was fed, I think. But I do remember now that she used to do most all the cooking and they used to, I think they said Grandma wasn't a very good cook. She had one dish called tomato, beef and tomatoes, and I still cook it exactly the way Grandma did it. But my mother, I knew later on when we, when I was a bit older, what a meticulous cook she was for detail. Everything she did by, when she cut anything or fashioned anything by hand, a hundred of them would look exactly the same size and the same, the same appearance. And, and she always used to say, 
it's better to be under seasoned than over seasoned in everything. So it was just very subtle cooking, not too much salt, not too much soy, and uh, strain the broth we talked about, that lovely clear broth. I remember her soups so clear. And I've tried to I've tried to emulate her style and I come close to some of her dishes, but I don't think my soups have ever been as perfect as hers. My wife learned from her mum, obviously, but she's got a kind of flamboyance to her style of cooking. That's one of the things she admires about what you do. Where do you think you got your flamboyance from? From my dad. <laughs> I, I know. Um, they were quite opposite in their personalities, Richard, as I as I think now, of course. Um, mum, mum was always fairly restrained in her personality, a little bit negative, perhaps, because of her background. Always always sort of scolding in a way to make you a better daughter, you know, um, as though it was the right thing for a Chinese mother to do, always always telling you, you know, giving you little lectures. I can remember she used to cook these awful herbs, herb <laughs> soups, and I could smell it. This is when we were living in Victoria Street, North Melbourne, and I reckon as far back as Errol Street, I could smell that she was boiling up those herbs for us when we got back from school. And she'd stand over us, ready to give me a little crack on the on the forehead if I didn't drink it. Then my father would come home. I'd, I'd evacuate until my dad got home. Then he'd make a game of it. He would rattle money in his pocket. And then he would say, two shillings for every mouthful, you know, <laughs> and we'd get it down in no time. But he, he made games of things, whereas Mother was always being the disciplinarian. So this was medicinal, this herbal drink, was it? Oh, was it? Yes. And oh, look, <laughs> I think people ask me now, do I have a secret about old age? Because I am a very mighty age now. And I've still got, I think, a fair bit of energy and uh, enthusiasm for life and Probably I don't look 90. And I'd say, probably I'd laugh and I'd say, well, I've got to eat a lot of rice or eat a lot of dim sims or something. But no, I think it's just I inherited. I inherited my, from my father a kind of playful optimism about life. There was once a, a book when I was a child called The Pollyanna Game. And everything that was negative, she'd play the game and it was called The Glad Game. Try to find something glad. And I think I've got a little bit of that. I still have it. <laughs> and I think that is one of the big secrets of life, to have a zest for life and to believe in life, I think. Elizabeth, you're the most senior person I've ever had on this program. I'm, I'm not surprised. <laughs> and it feels like I'm talking to someone who's younger than me. Um, oh. <laughs> wh where did your mum and where did your family find the Chinese ingredients in those days? They must have been hard to get in Melbourne back in the day. Well, no. Um, we could always get those basic things. Australia's got so much abundance in fresh food. You can turn anything into a Chinese dish if you've got the technique. It's not reliant on ingredients as such, but fresh ingredients. Indeed, you know? but what about things like really good soy sauce or rice wine or things like that? Was that around or did you make, a, make your own at home? No, we didn't have rice wine. We used dry sherry. I can remember <laughs> the dry sherry. My first book only, only writes dry sherry, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then little by little, the ingredients came from all other parts of China. And the Shoxing wine that you talk about comes from an area East China near Shanghai. And all of that was closed because um, of the war and then, of course, the, the Cultural Revolution. And my father, being a fierce nationalist, we had food from Hong Kong. That was probably OK. But then when, when we had different ingredients from China, my father would not dream of buying them. <laughs> Nothing from the mainland. Wow. The mainland, no. Nothing from Mao Zedong. Absolutely. He said that, was, you know, and I can remember when the Peking opera came out, and I'm a bit of an opera fan, but not Chinese opera, but I didn't know the difference then, and I wanted to go, and my father... It forbade me on the threat of death <laughs> if, I, if I wanted to do anything from mainland China. But, of course, we have to change. <laughs> we have to accept. One of the things I like about Chinese kitchens is the smell of steamed rice. What does that mean for you? Oh, it means home, Richard. Look, honestly, I can remember coming home from school, even from those early days living in the shop above the factory. But if the rice was cooking, it's like... I don't know. You, you can smell it. You, you don't get it in these automatic um, electric rice cookers. You only get it from cooking rice in a pot and it's steaming. And it's just a welcome. It's, it's very 
that's just a comfort smell. Mm. I think it'd be akin to Europeans when they can smell bread baking in the oven. It seems like most great cuisines of the world have very basic values in common. And yeah. the two most important ones, I think, correct me if I'm wrong here, freshness and simplicity. Absolutely. Would you add anything to that? Oh, of course. I think all the great cuisines are devoted to balance. Um, I couldn't stand it when I could see Australians in a Chinese restaurant ordering one dish after the other that each individual wanted or liked, and they were all battered, say, or all fried. Mm. And I'd say, oh, your meat is so unbalanced, it's awful, you know. And I'd have to stop myself from going over and saying, let me order for you. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's my, my mother never, ever gave us an unbalanced meal. I can see that now, how she would have a clear soup always a clear soup and then there would be supposing she did a braised fish which meant a little bit of oil a little bit of frying then she would have a steamed chicken and if she did a steamed fish then she would braise a chicken you know there'd be two different techniques and always accompanying one meat dish was double that amount in in the green vegetable you're killing me here, Elizabeth. I'm hungry now. Oh, uh, that's a nice feeling, though, Richard. Isn't it is. It? it is a nice feeling. It sounds like your family family life was quite comfortable. Your dad was a successful businessman. Did you go to fancy schools, Elizabeth? <laughs> would you call PLC fancy? Yes, I would. Presbyterian Ladies College. That is pretty fancy. Yes. We didn't call it fancy. We probably called it prestigious. <laughs> Indeed. Being a snob. No. Yes. Well, I think my father. I don't know. I'm sure private schools would comparatively just as expensive as now in those days. And uh, he, that big business he had at the market, he was very successful. I think it was the second largest wholesale business. And then he used to have other interests that weren't connected with that wholesale business with his brothers. He'd do it on his own with my mum and they were the sort of food businesses, like the Dim Sims, for instance. He did that with my mum and that business was called Wing Lee, Lee being my mother's maiden name. And um, I think he must have made enough money all the time because he was just a natural, he had a natural business acumen and it gave him delight. Just the success of doing something well, I think he loved. And he must have had enough money because he had six, six, uh, six children, four girls went to PLC, two brothers went to Scotch College. That's not bad, is it? That's not bad at all. Your family history on your dad's side goes back to the 1850s. Right. What was it that brought your grandfather to Australia then? Was it the gold rush? No, it wasn't. Uh, Gold Rush happened to be about the same time, but he was an indentured labourer, I believe. They didn't have the cheap convict labour anymore and they were looking for cheap labour labour to clear the bush, make roads, build railroads, things like that. And so they looked to southern China, I think, because it was closer, and um, many heard that this land of the New Gold Mountain was wanting wanting labourers. And I don't know who contacted who, but my grandfather came out in, I think, 1853. I think he was 17, chosen by the village. Clearing the bush, yeah. building roads and railroads on slave ways or thereabouts. Absolutely. And they, they did it the hard way, you know, pick and shovel. What do you know of him, Elizabeth? Not, not even one photograph, but I believe my younger brother looked like him from what I was told by an old uncle because he would never have his photograph taken. Uh, but he was much, much older than my grandmother. Like how much older? How much older are we talking about? Oh, I believe, Richard, would you believe, when he married my grandmother, she was 18 and he was 58. Good God. Was he married in Australia to her or in China? <laughs> no, he married my grandmother in Wagunya. That's where he went. You know Wagunya? In Victoria? Yeah, up near Rutherglen. He was sent there to clear the roads and... He must have had natural leadership qualities because I believe then he became a contractor employing Chinese labourers to work under him while he oversaw it all. Then he owned Wagunya's general store, importing stuff for the gold miners, so he became a businessman, a merchant, as well as being a road contractor. And um, he did have an Australian family in Wagunya. He had an Australian family in, in we Wagunya? Have, we have had little... I thought was quite a little stories that have come out that we haven't been able to follow up, that there was a family that he had. And then he married a Chinese wife. How did, how did that work? They didn't marry. I suppose they were just lonely 
lonely men, of course. And 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 I suppose, you know, he had a very happy life with an Australian woman, I believe. And I think he must have had children by her from what we've heard. And then I don't know when when it was decided that 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 had to come to an end, but I believe they all went to Perth. And then he sent to China to have a Chinese wife. And he was, would you believe he was um, 58, you know, when he decided to do that. So I don't think he was single all the way until he was 58. So he was 58 when he married. He had six children, my father being fourth born in Wagonia. And then he moved back to China. Why did he want to move back to China at that age? Oh, well, now he's 65. My dad is five years old and he decides that it's time to die <laughs> and to bury your bones in, in, in your own home soil back in your village. And so he, he took his family back and he took his children back to China. So how did your dad make his way back to Australia then, the country of his birth? Well, I think he and his older brothers went to primary school in the little village part of China, of South China. Then when he was a young lad and his brothers were two brothers older than he, they decided that they would do better as teenagers if they came back to Australia. They're Australian born and they have Australian citizenship. And they knew that they were allowed to own property and to conduct business. And there was very little of any improvement in the village. They would have just been farmers, I guess. And and so the boys decided to um, come back to Victoria, which they knew. The land of the New Gold Mountain, as it was known in, in China. Which was what Australia was called, yeah. So they all came back. I think Dad might have been 15, and he was apprenticed to a clan uncle. How did he meet your mum then in Australia? Oh, well, well he and his brothers, they, 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 they began their business um, ideas and things in Victoria. And by the time my father was 24, he was pretty well established as a good businessman of the Victoria market. And he decided that 24, not 58 like his dad, <laughs> he went to China to ask a matchmaker to find a suitable wife for him. And the matchmaker did a good job because they were ideally suited, even though I know they had opposite personalities, but they had so much respect and love between them. It was just, I think, one of those lucky things. But he did specify, I believe, and when I challenged him about it, he just smiled. He he asked the matchmaker to find a woman who was strong, (laughs) who was not terribly intelligent, (laughs) <laughs> not too clever, I think was the word. Not, you know, not, not, a, not a know-all. Right. And someone who was not too pretty. Ah. He, he, he thought, you know, a beautiful woman was, was trouble, I guess. <laughs> and so my mother was chosen. And I just she does fit the bill. She's a hands, she was handsome rather than pretty. Good courage, very strong, physically very strong. You know, steady sort of a personality, Mum. So was it hard for them to stay in Australia? This is the 1920s we're getting to now and the White Australia policy is a big deal. Was it hard for them to stay in Australia? Well, I'm told that my father had to go through the whole procedure every six months to get a new visa all the time. And it seemed that um, he was able to keep renewing it because he could prove that he had financial means of supporting her, but he had to keep renewing it, except... In 1929, it was a bad time, evidently, and the Chinese were not welcomed, and the government passed a rule, a legislation, that Chinese not born in Australia had to return to China. And that meant my mother, not my father, my mother. But my father, my eldest sister, Ruby, my brother, Tom, And mum was heavily pregnant with her third child and that was when she had to return to China. She had to pass a dictation test. Of course she couldn't. She didn't speak a word of English. And so my dad sold... He had a lovely little terrace house in Grattan Street, Carlton, and he sold that up and they took a boat back to China. Then they went back to... Then they got to the village in China and two years later I was born in China. But my father commuted backwards and forwards with his business and coming, coming and going. So he then persuaded the Australian government to let his wife move back to Australia and his daughters, dear God. Yeah, but there was a separation then of um, five years or so. My mother wasn't allowed to come back. 
I was three, so I think in 1929 they had to come back. In 1934, they got a new visa for it, 1934. That was all so cruel and foolish. Well, still like that, isn't it? It's still a sad case for refugees. I mean, I, I lived through that, but I, I wasn't aware of it being so small. But somehow or another, I think my mother might have just accepted that that's her lot, but that's, that's the way things were. But my father, I think, always was able to make it right, you know, so that was the only time that they were separated. And she's lived in Australia from 1934 right until she died. This is Conversations with Richard Feidler. Hear more conversations anytime on the ABC Listen app or go to abc.net.au slash conversations. Elizabeth, your father was instrumental in the development of the classic deep-fried dim sim in this country. Tell me how that came out of the traditional steamed Chinese dumpling called the siu mai. Yeah, well, you know the siu mai, don't you? I do. <laughs> I do. They're delicious. I, I could eat it right now. I you could know? too. And I could too. They're very tasty, yeah. It was 1942, war years here, and there were evidently quite a few elderly Chinese men left over from the goldfield days who never made it back to China or never made it good here. And they used to go to my father for, you know, advice and help. And my father could find them odd jobs, but then some of them were too elderly for labouring jobs. And so there was a bit of a dilemma. I, I can remember my father putting some of them into old men's homes. There was one in Cheltenham and they were so miserable. They died there because they, they couldn't speak the language and the food was pulling to them, to Chinese old men. And my father thought if he could find some way to support these men, he could see that this little flower pot <laughs> dim sim fashioned on the little silmai was in Chinese cafes everywhere and Australians loved them. They loved them to death. You know, they would go to the Chinese cafe, as we used to do too, and just buy them in a brown paper bag. And they were called dim sim, which is a, a dialect aberration of dim sum. And then Dad thought these could be manufactured wholesale, big, in the factory that he had. And these elderly men could take them and he would lease some caravans for them and they could take them around the races and to the football and out in the streets and go to the munitions factories and supply lunch for the workers there with these dim sims. And uh, they proved to be so popular and it made a great living for these elderly men. He was good at combining a bit of philanthropy with a bit of business acumen. And how did it get from being the steamed dim sim to the deep fried thing? Just by chance. <laughs> We'd never heard of a fried dim sim. And my, at that time when Dad was distributing these dim sims to these elderly men, a lot of them were living down at Cheltenham for some reason. And my brother Tom had just joined the firm and he had a carload or a truckload of these dim sims to take to the old men and for them to sell. And on the way, he had to pass through Morty Alec. And as Tom's warrant, he used to call in to his friend Joe, who had the fish and chip shop at Morty Alec. And he said, oh, it's a fine day. Let's go out fishing because Joe had a little fishing boat. And when they came back, they usually would have fish and chips for lunch. And Tom said to Joe, he said, I've got something in the car you might have never seen before. We call them dim sims. How about you would like some of those for lunch? So Tom took them into the shop and Joe just promptly put them in his deep fry. <laughs> what else did he have? <laughs> and Tom said, these are pretty good <laughs> fried. He said, but we usually steam them. And, of course, Joe had never heard of what a steamer was. So I think the next day Tom took him the steamer and gave him some more. He said, we love we love them. And then I think the week had hardly gone when Joe rang and said, all oh, my mates want them now. <laughs> and in those days, Richard, all the fish and chip shops were owned by Greeks. Not Chinese people, but Greek people. Yeah. So the deep fried dim sim is the work of, of Chinese and Greek migrants working hand Absolutely. in hand. Absolutely, I like that. Yes, yes, it was. And they're still like that because then it got into every fish and chip shop in Victoria before long. And then he got the big bright idea of getting an engineer to create a machine. Dad was responsible for the first dim sim machine. 
He said, look, if they make sausage rolls by machine, what's the difference? It's a filling, you know, and a casing. And so this German engineer invented this first dim sim machine. And then they were turning them out by the hundreds and thousands then. So you can go to any fish and chip shop today and say half a dozen fried and half a dozen steamed. At this time, though, you're growing up and you're going to a prestigious private school, as we said. What did you envisage for yourself as a young woman, Elizabeth, career-wise? I never envisaged that I would be a cook myself. To tell the truth, we used to have an armour at home. We did the cooking. I didn't even know how to cook rice when I was married. I had very improbable aspirations to be an opera singer, a concert pianist. <laughs> and then when I think I realised I didn't have the talent for either, then I dropped just thinking I could be a journalist. But I ended up being a school teacher. What was social life for young Chinese Australians back in those days? Well, for me, my social life was centred around the family and other Chinese families similar to ours from that same district and they all settled, you know, in areas very close to each other like West Melbourne, North Melbourne and, 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 and so that little community of Chinese people stuck together and we had a little Chinese mission church called the Chinese Church of Christ Mission Church in Queensbury Street, Carlton. And my social life was in that little church. You know, we had games and social outings and it was a very what do you call, protected sort of society, I guess. Social life was more or less just with family and very close friends. And then as a young teenager, things changed, of course, we were growing up and we wanted a little bit more, I guess. And there was another Chinese group. They were called the Young Chinese League. And they were made up mostly of Chinese who had never even been to China, but they had Chinese blood. Some, they might have even had a, a quarter or an eighth Chinese blood, but they belonged to the Chinese League and they were very socially gregarious. They used to have dances and balls and uh, they used to play cards and mahjong and and all that sort of stuff was frowned upon. <laughs> and I wasn't allowed to join the Young Chinese League because I used to play cards, and that was considered to be sinful, and they danced, which was sinful. <laughs> and my brother, Tom, he said he wanted to play football with them because they used to have a, a great Young Chinese League football team that used to tour Victoria, you know, to the cars, to the country and play. And my, my parents must have thought that was all right for Tom to play football. But then that gave Irene and I, my sister and I, great excuse. We're going to follow Tom and see him play. So we used to say we we're only going to see Tom play football. But through that, I would meet other Chinese people from the Young Chinese League. And so my social life broadened a little bit at those football things. And then gradually, I have a feeling my parents didn't know. We went to a few of the dances with Tom, always as our chaperone, I think. And then we heard later on that my cousin had become engaged to a, an Australian Chinese from Bairnsdale. And we got a wedding invitation. He had four other brothers. There were five boys. And at that wedding, I met my husband there. He was best man. He was the brother of the groom. And so somehow or another was accepted by my parents that I could play tennis. And so that's how you met Norm, your husband-to-be. And what did your parents, what did your parents make of that match? Well, they, they had no objections to Norm himself because they didn't know him. But they very wisely said they're very different from us, different backgrounds. They weren't Chinese enough, I think, to... Their mother was half Irish because that was, you know, a lot of the early Chinese didn't have Chinese women to marry and then the mixed marriages came about. So did your parents try to dissuade you from marrying him then? In subtle ways. My dad went and uh, said, oh, look, I believe there's a, a maiden ship going on a, on a maiden voyage from, from Melbourne and I can get, get, get a nice trip for you and Irene and you can have a holiday in this boat and they end up in Queensland. And unbeknownst to me, he'd organised some young Chinese single men in Queensland to, to escort us around. <laughs> and I think my father had the hope that after two weeks away, we might have got romance out of our minds, mainly because I was too young also. I was only 17 or 18 then. And did it work? No, we came back and both out. The Chong brothers were waiting for Irene and I when the boat stopped and, and so it went on. 
So you and your sister Irene then married Norm and his brother. Was it a double wedding then? It was, yes. Norm was a chemist and Jeff was a, a dentist. And what was the reception like? I mean, it's a pretty big deal having a reception at a Chinese wedding. Well, once again, typical of my dad. We lived in Burke Road in uh, North Baldwin. It was a big double-storey house with a triple garage. And he turned that triple garage into a Chinese restaurant. He had he had a restaurant then. And he had three Chinese chefs man, manning the walks there. He had the driveway with the open spits for doing the, the pigs. Wow. And then the front that was all done out in arches and lanterns. And, and then in the backyard, he had a big marquee set up. And, uh, yes, we had a big wedding. <laughs> we sure did. He, when he knew that... The weddings were going to be inevitable. He just did the best, he, you know, always for us. So when you got married, was that the first time you'd ever had to cook? Yes. I think I might have been naturally OK with it because I don't remember... I can remember the first dinner party. I cooked everything. I was very proud of it and we sat down and there was no rice. I forgot that you have to cook rice. But Irene was so funny, she she never, ever liked cooking. And I believe that when she came back from the honeymoon, Jeff went to his surgery and he came back at 6 o'clock or something and he said, what's for dinner, Irene? And, and she said, what's it got to do with me? <laughs> <laughs> she expected dinner to arrive. <laughs> she expected somebody else to do it. So you and Norm went on to have four kids together. How did family life pan out for you, Elizabeth? Um, for a start, like all marriages, everything was sort of like uh, fairy tale stuff, lovely. And I thought, well, this is okay, except that I gradually came to realise that I didn't know my husband very well. Um, in my day, Richard, courting meant going to the movies once a week. That was it. You didn't didn't get to know each other that well. And if a girl went out with a fella for any length of time without getting engaged, she was meant to be a pretty bad girl, actually. Mm. You know, you only went out with a person if you thought you were going to marry them. So you didn't really know Norm before I didn't you got really, married? I think I didn't really know because I could see I could see he had a chinks in his character that I didn't understand at all and he he didn't have a way of communicating the way I was used to in my family we're very gregarious you know my father talked a lot and we laughed a lot and he was he was just sort of did his own thing and he he had a pharmacy and after a while not too many years after we were married he was spending six days a week at that pharmacy and not coming home until 11.30 or almost midnight every night because he was always saying he's busy at the shop. And I, I accepted that because I thought, well, he's working awfully hard. I have to do my bit. And I used to keep dinner for him every night till late. <laughs> and then I realised that, that was just his bachelor way. He liked his own life there and he made his own time schedule. And I believe also he was running his own little bookmaking business during the day and didn't have much time for prescriptions and used to do them at night. Um, <laughs> but And I was lonely. I was personally questioning, is this what my life will always be? I mean, I had my children, of course, and I still had my own sisters and my mum and dad there. But I was missing out on, on a close, intimate relationship with a special person, which I thought should be my right. He, he never did. He thought he thought marriage was wonderful. He used to go to work, do what he wanted, come home and have a nice warm house and a, and a good meal. And what else would, would he want? And, but I was lonely. So how long did you stick it out together as a married couple? I finally left after 24 years. I'm not saying the whole lot of it's miserable. In the end, in the last, say... 15 years of my marriage, at least, I I was unhappy. I was unhappy. So you would have been in your 40s when that happened? I was 44. Did you still have to have a kind of, some kind of romance in your life after that? Oh, Richard, that gets pretty personal now. Yes. <laughs> Maybe I was pretty vulnerable after being lonely that way for so long that about a year after I separated... I did meet somebody and I guess 
that person just fitted, uh, just almost was perfect in every way a woman could want in a relationship. When my husband was uncommunicative, we talked and we sang together. He was musical. He played the piano and I used to sing. And we would enjoy so much together. I did. We did so much together, whereas I was doing everything on my own before with like a single mum. And I never enjoyed companionship that much. And he was gentle, whereas Norman had a quick temper, which I didn't understand because my father never had a temper. And this new man in my life was was gentle. And um, I guess all I can say now, I, I did lose eventually. But um, the time I had with him, the happiness that we gave each other was a gift. I'd say it was a gift in my life. And I could never, never, ever want it taken away or it's better to have loved and lost, as they say, than have loved it all. How did the relationship with this man, Jim, end? Uh, I never thought it could end. I thought, how could anything so wonderful ever end? And and yet I couldn't see past that it wouldn't work. He came from another country. He came from England. And I could never live away from my family. And he had to go back. But I couldn't see past that. I thought he could stay in Australia, I guess, but he didn't want to. He wanted to get back to uh, his homeland and he was divorced, but he had two children back there, two girls, and he he went back, I thought, just to, just to sort of sort out his work priorities and things and come back to me. I was so believing that love is forever, <laughs> ever and ever. <laughs> and um, then, then, then the phone calls came to say that he had decided that he would not come back to Australia and it was goodbye. And I I found that very, very hard to believe. Even not too long ago, I even, I suppose, I even thought that one day we would be together, but I've since found out that he's passed away now. It's so long ago. I was only 40-something then and now I'm 90. So, But I even thought that we would eventually, you know, like that movie, As Time Goes By... <laughs> I thought we'd meet each other again in old age because everything seemed so perfect. And it was then, but he had perhaps didn't have exactly the same feelings as I in the end. I think for a while he did. He had daughters, though. He had daughters. And his home was his home. And maybe, maybe I'm judging men a little bit harshly, I don't think they're as sentimental as women in one way. They can be more cut and dried about what they have to do, mm. we cling on to, we cling on to these sort of romantic ideas. Meanwhile, while all this is going on, you were filled with this missionary zeal to bring real Chinese food yes. to Australians, yeah. real Chinese yeah, food. Not, not bring it, it was here, but they didn't know it. And I was going to show them in my own cooking classes how how simple and yet how sophisticated even simple home meals were. It wasn't the gluggy dishes that they thought, wasn't all the battered food they thought. So I felt like I was evangelising <laughs> uh, without knowing, but look, mainly because I shared my home life with them while I cooked. I'd say, this is how my mother taught me this. And she, and then I'd tell a story about what she told me about something or, you know, so I always related it to everyday Chinese living. And my students were so eager to learn about another world through the food, of course, and I was eager to give it to them. And so it was a natural, it was just a natural career. So it, it kind of found me. Did you find yourself being revealed to yourself in a way, Elizabeth? Because I think it proves uh, there's real deep art and history and culture in the food you make, and you've written about that too. Do you think it revealed yourself to you in the sense that you realised really deep down you're an artist? I mean, if you'd set yourself to painting or music or something as a, as a life, you would have been very successful at that as well. What, what do you think of that, Elizabeth? Well, I, I never thought of myself as an artist, no. I thought of myself as a cook, but as I became a little bit more 
grounded in what I was doing and people were getting to know me, then I realised that I did have a gift. There were plenty of other people better cooks than I. I don't think it was that. I think it was the fact that I, I knew when I was demonstrating first for nothing, just as a hobby for fundraising and so forth, that I had a natural affinity with people and that I communicated with them in a way that they loved. And what's more, I sort of loved them as well, you know, in doing it. Every time I, I gave a class, at the end of it, I would feel I've done a good job. And they would leave me looking so happy and thanking me so warmly, so even if I wasn't paid for it. <laughs> it was pretty good reward because I, ha I ha kind of had their affection. And I think that, humbly, I think that's a gift that I have when I'm teaching. Well, that's the art of it. I mean, you make the food, but you can recognise the history in it, oh, yes. the philosophy behind it, and then communicate it to people. That's that's the art, isn't it, as well as the... Uh... No, no, I suppose it is. It's the love. Yes, I suppose a painter's the same and a musician or the piano. It's the love you put into when you're playing the piano that comes over to the audience that's listening, not just the notes, is it? It's, it's more than that. And I guess my food did express that, my pride and my love for my own cuisine and my own people. So you grew up knowing the traditions of Cantonese cooking, which is very specific to a region, but along the way you picked up Shanghainese style oh, of cooking, yeah. Sichuan styles yes. of cooking, yes. Vietnamese styles of cooking. How did you pick up these different, these other schools of, of Chinese cuisine, which come from parts of China that you weren't as familiar with? I think it might have been... Um way back, way back in 1980, when I realised that I can't keep cooking the same dishes. I can't keep cooking this and teaching the same dishes. I can do a, a twist or a spin on them or something, but I knew myself I needed to expand my own knowledge. So There's only so many siu mai you can, you can steam <laughs> before you need to do something else. Oh, you need to add some Sichuan pepper to something true. and see what happens then, don't you? Yeah, but I, I knew because the world was opening up and people were travelling a lot too. And um, I travelled a lot by then too, by the 1980s. And I was thinking, no, for my own sake, I have to know more about Chinese cuisine apart from Cantonese cuisine. Uh, I started off, though, to learn in Hong Kong. And I went under a chef there and I, I took lessons from him. And then I found another chef in Hong Kong who, who taught Shanghai cooking. So I did that as well. And then in my travels then, I would always then make it my point to talk to different chefs, you know, whether I was in um, Chengdu and I'd learn a bit of Sichuan cooking. And, and, of course, a lot of reading, a lot of test cooking, a lot of talking with other chefs. And so you extend and broaden your own knowledge and your own appreciation and, the, and you know, you just keep teaching yourself in a way because the fundamentals are much the same, Richard. The technique is much the same. But the understanding of the different ingredients and how to use them, that, that's not common in every region. They're different. So there's been a huge shift in the perception of Chinese food and you've played a very large role in that in this yeah. country. There's no doubt about that. To the point now, Elizabeth, where I think it seems fantastic, it certainly to my kids would seem extraordinary to imagine that Chinese food was regarded as this kind of yeah. thing that was done cheap and cheerful on the side and was a lesser cuisine in any way. I mean, that just seems, now that seems weird. But I think that there's still many, many kids who see Chinese food as still cheap and cheerful. I haven't reached everybody. <laughs> Uh, and I, I think, but on the whole, I have changed a, a big perception, I know, of it. But I think there are some people who still think Chinese food doesn't rank as one of the top cuisines in the world, alongside French, for instance, and that still rankles. I don't know. You can get bok choy and coals anywhere these days, Elizabeth, I reckon. So well, What do they do with it when they go home, do you think? I don't know. Probably deep frying it like dim sims, I suppose. <laughs> I don't know. But <laughs> I, I still find that there is a gap in their appreciation and understanding. Uh, it has lessened a lot, and I suppose 
<laughs> somebody else after me will will keep on keep on evangelizing it, gospeling it. I don't know. The thing about anything that comes from Chinese cultural Chinese history is there's no end to it. China's so big, it's been around for so long, it's so historically sort of great and enormous that once you embark on even on even something, one aspect of Chinese culture, like like cooking or history or yeah. art or poetry or what have you, you could you can still be finding new things. Of course. In, in right to the way to the end of your life. Are you still finding new things oh, that yes. make you happy and oh, excited in Chinese food? Absolutely. And that's the joy of it, isn't it? I, I think the discovery and as soon as I feel confident enough, I'm going to travel somewhere, maybe Singapore's the quickest way and learn more things. Elizabeth, it's been a delight and an honour to speak with you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Richard. It was lovely to speak with you too. Yeah, I'm going to eat now. Oh, good. I will too. <laughs> I will too. <laughs> This is Conversations with Richard Weidler. My guest today was Elizabeth Chong, who I spoke to in March this year. This has been our final episode for 2022, and there are a number of people who deserve our most urgent and tearful thanks. Justine Kelly, Bridget Berger and Alison Barclay for their support and for helping us fill out the ABC paperwork correctly. Sarah, who do you want to thank? Richard, as well as thanking you, I want to thank our excellent engineers, Steve Fieldhouse, David White, David LeMay, Ni Adapawibi, Sai Rewalui, Matt Hiley, Stephen Tilly, Timothy Nicastri, Craig Tilmouth and Pete Scott. We've had some fabulous guest presenters across this year, so a big thanks to Sally Sara, Ed LeBrock and Lisa Leong. Thanks also to Charlie King and producer Lisa Pellegrino for their NAIDOC Week stories from the top end. But really, our biggest thanks go to our remarkable producers, Nicola Harrison, Alice Moldovan and Maggie Morris for fossicking for the nuggets that make the conversation's gold. And a huge thanks from both Sarah and I to our EP, Carmel Rooney, for willingly sticking her hands into the <laughs> gluggy, messy clay of conversations and sculpting it on the wheel into something beautiful. We'd like to thank you, our listeners, of course, for your guest suggestions and for once again making us the ABC's and indeed Australia's most listened to podcast. So that's it, Sarah. Time to down tools and dash for the exits. I'm Richard Feidler. Hot on your heels, I'm Sarah Konoski. Thanks for listening. You've been listening to a podcast of Conversations. For more Conversations interviews, please go to the website, abc.net.au slash conversations. Hi, I'm Judith Lucy and I'm overwhelmed and living. Remember the masterpiece that was my first podcast, Overwhelmed and Dying, back in 2020? A lot has happened since then. And with the exception of me finally getting laid, almost none of it's been good. COVID and the lockdowns made a lot of us look at our lives and think, this sucks. I sure did. So in my new series, I'm asking, can I really change my life? And while I'm about it, do more about climate change. Overwhelmed and Living with me, Judith Lucy, is out now on the ABC Listen app.